Let's take a look at some Ethereum charts for this week's article on Brave New Coin. We'll start off with something nice and exciting like hash rate and difficulty. So since April 2019, the lows here, you know, we had a low in hash rate, which is the non-dashed line, the solid line here in uh, January 2020, which sort of coincided with this ice age, this inflation in, not inflation, but increase in uh, difficulty having a few times now. It's basically them coding in the need to switch to proof of stake before it actually happened or the incentive to switch to proof of stake before it actually happened. So they remedied that in uh, January 2020. And ever since then, it's been rising slightly, but flat, certainly within the range of the past year plus. The big thing here is uncertainty regarding proof of work on Ethereum in that there's no straightforward plan as far as which day they want to switch over everything to proof of stake. Just that eventually they'll want to switch over everything to proof of stake. So if you're a miner, a manufacturer, anybody involved in the process for F hash or at hash, I never know how to say that, ASICs, you're not going to get involved. You're not going to want to get involved here because there's just no long-term future to collect ROI. You don't know if tomorrow you're going to get bricked or a month from now you're going to get bricked. You just don't know. So it makes sense that the hash rate is predicting the uncertainty here by not increasing people who have the miners who have the ASICs are turning them on using them while they can but I don't expect a massive increase in ETH hash rate anytime soon one thing that could change that is if ETH price skyrockets then it could support the additional hash rate if we look at the ASICs right now most of these were released in 2019 only one in or excuse me most of these released in 2018 only one in 2019 uh Lindsay L-I-N-Z-H-I also did ASICs, I think, for this algorithm. I don't know why it's not on in this website, but maybe they were never released. I'm not really sure. In general, though, 50% of these are profitable. 50% of them aren't. Any of the Inno Silicon ones are profitable. ASICs. These are all individual ASICs here. This is at four cents per kilowatt hour, which is basically any miner at scale is getting that or better. I think for electricity costs. So you're doing pretty well at these higher ASICs, even with ETH price as low as it is now relative to where it was earlier in the year. But at some point, if you're on the Panda miner train, you're thinking to yourself, probably why bother? Cause <laughs> you're not making any money. Uh, there's no ROI here, you know, looking at blocks per day and inflation, you can see that blocks per day is sort of an all time high in that blocks are clearing every 13 seconds, which is kind of counterintuitive to what you think to security in that, Oh, this chain confirms quicker. I can send things quicker. Yes, you can, but it all depends on who's accepting those transactions. If they want 100 confirmations versus five confirmations on BTC at 10 minutes a pop, you got to factor that in. If there are 200,000 pending transactions on ETH because people are sending a lot of tether, you got to factor that in. Uh, Inflation or issuance is down slightly from the beginning of the year, but not very much. So there's just flat even when you compare it to most of 2019 now this is ethereum on or excuse me this is usdt on ethereum this light green line here this is usdt on omni you can see in mid to late 2019 erc20 usdt overtook omni usdt and these are average transaction values these are transactions per day and for the most part the ethereum tether transactions have kept up in the average transaction values with Omni, even though there's way more transactions on Ethereum. So long-term, if Ethereum Ethereum cannot scale long-term, Tether will kill it because this will continue to increase. It is a parasite in that it doesn't care which chain it's on. It'll go to Omni. It'll go to Tether. It'll go to Bob's surplus chain. It doesn't care. Whatever chain is accepted by exchanges and is easily sent by traders and most of the people actually using Tether for speculation, it'll just collapse under its own weight on Ethereum and then move to the next chain. <laughs> That's how it is, whether it be Tron or EOS or whatever. So I'm definitely very interested in where this goes over the course of the next year, over the next two years. You know, do they, if they move to proof of stake in time, if Ethereum moves to proof of stake in time, is that enough to support the massive tether burden on the chain? As of right now, 35% of all transaction costs are from tether alone, not DeFi, not anything else. So it's very interesting. We'll see what happens here.
Definitely. It's been a wild ride for Tether, whether you're a fan or not. Let's look at transactions per day, which is the line here, and the fees on Ethereum. So this is a bit misleading. This is averages per week per seven days rolling. So fees actually spiked pretty high on the 12th uh, when you know transactions sort of peaked as well. So overall, transactions are up from earlier in the year, definitely. You generally see spike spikes or peaks in transactions when you have sudden movements in price. Same thing with fees, because everyone's going to send it to exchange or they're going to send it off on exchange. You know, capitulation, fear, that those sort of emotions all play into, I got to get this on the exchange, I got to sell it, I'm losing a ton of money, that sort of thing. So certainly more bullish than bearish. Uh, and it's interesting just to always look at the fees to see how well can this thing scale? You know, what what are the pending transactions? Again, I mentioned 200,000 pending. That was like the peak of March 12th or March 13th, something like that. So ETH knows it's got scaling issues. It's being worked on. It was supposed to be released mid this year as far as the ETH 2.0 phase zero. We'll see if that happens. But people are definitely using Ethereum to send stuff, whether it be DeFi related or Tether related. Here's NVT inverse metric of economic utility and daily active addresses in the fill here. So in a vacuum, this is amazingly bullish. NVT went from an all-time high to a massive spike down. It's just a massive spike down. And much like any chain, when you look at NVT, you have to think, is inflation accounted for? Is DeFi accounted for? Is off-chain, side-chain stuff accounted for? On Ethereum specifically, it isn't. So this value is kind of pointless in that there's much more DeFi stuff than there ever used to be. So there's much more um, like off-chain, side-chain stuff than there ever used to be. A lot of sending in between contracts, that sort of thing. I don't think that's fully captured here, especially with the DAI stuff and the uh, MakerDAO stuff. But to see daily active addresses go to a multi- year high, extremely bullish. And this is a monthly average. So it's not just like a one and done sort of thing. So overall in a vacuum, both of these extremely bullish. Uh, I always like to look at this and have a chuckle. This is token sales finished as well as month uh, money raised per month. And, you know, June 2018, clearly the, the peak insanity of raises. And ever since then, it's just trended to zero. This was uh, Bitfinex's Leo raise, which probably shouldn't even be on this chart because it wasn't on Ethereum, but I like to put it on here anyway. And it's actually even hard to get data for raises and sales ending anymore because there's so much junk. It's just like if you look at four websites, you'll get four different values for the number of token sales ended. I think because most of those are just scams. So <laughs> even these values I'm not so sure on anymore. I just think the raises in general are, have gone to zero. Uh, regardless of what this chart says, based on the data I've found. But uh, yeah, super interesting. So ICOs for sure are dead. What is not dead are the treasuries, which are dying in that they're being withdrawn from, which is good if you're a long-term holder. You don't want to see the supply glut. You know, it's great for short-term speculation when supply is getting absorbed by all these ICOs and then the music stops. That doesn't happen anymore. Price kind of follows that. And then you get this further drop in price based on the supply glut because your overhead costs for an ICO as a business generally aren't paid for or paid out in ETH. They're paid out in USD or some other currency. So you're going to have to sell the ETH. So it's more selling pressure on top of decreased demand. So it's good that this is all going to zero. This big spike uh, this quarter was the Digix Dow refunding uh, people holding DGD. DGD got delisted pretty much everywhere. This, this was probably the best case scenario for the project, which had 356,000 ETH or something like that. It's just an insane amount of ETH still. So <laughs> I think they did the right thing. The project either wasn't living up to its potential or wasn't going anywhere fast, fast enough. So if I was them sitting on that war chest, I'd be pretty nervous. So good on them for returning it. So we're just above 1 million here now on the known ICO treasuries. And that's good. It shouldn't take too much longer for all this to pretty much go to zero, just like uh, token sales. You know, we'll see this long decay from projects that don't need the overhead 
or don't need the money to spend immediately. But there's no longer this massive 4 million supply glut just sitting there waiting to be sold to keep price down. If we look at the top dApps over the past week by volume, everything's pretty much been dominated by DeFi and exchanges or DeFi exchanges, if you want to think of it like that, depending on how you categorize this stuff, which to me is good. It says that the ETH is growing up. All this is speculation. So it's not necessarily economic value in the sense that it's useful to society, but it's moving away from uh, gambling and illegal stuff everywhere. It's moving towards interesting derivatives or interesting lending opportunities, that sort of thing. ETH locked in DeFi peaked at 3 million and then it spiked down pretty hard on the 12th. I don't know if this is an artifact or real. We'll know over time. I don't know what their data is uh, on DeFi Pulse, but this was the March 12th drop and it's since recovered, but there's certainly a decreasing trend from the highs. We'll put it that way. This is the Google Trends for Ethereum, the word Ethereum. Um, pretty decent spikes early in the year with the spikes in price. Nothing really insane, you know, until it's above 25, whatever that means. Um, that's when I'd start to get excited about long-term, mid-term potential for bullish continuation. Not really seeing that uh, currently. Moving on to technicals. Let's take a look at Bitfinex Open Interest, VPVR, volume profile of the visible range, yearly pivots, volume per day, and RSI. First thing you'll notice is ETH longs are just crushing all-time highs day over day. They still are. I don't have a lot of information on who's who this is or why. You can see even on the March 12th drop, there was a massive spike in longs. So that says people were loading the boat pretty substantially on that drop. You don't see that with most of the other coins. Most of the other coins, longs got hit pretty hard on that drop. The long short ratio is like 91%, 92% long, something like that. So there's definitely a long squeeze in the making here, more so than there's ever been for ETH. If this goes south, if this makes new lows below 100, oh man, it's going to get real ugly <laughs> because this long, this new long, new longs up here are going to just unwind, unwind, unwind. So they basically are all new positions since, uh, you know, this local bottom, let's say. So it'd have to break 100 essentially for these people to get nervous or this person to get nervous. Uh, no bullish or bearish divergences on RSI. RSI did hit a nice multi-month low like it did for everything else. Massive spike in volume here on this drop. I think the long open interest was part of that. And the yearly pivots tell me that resistance is coming up here for ETH to the upside. You know, just like everything else, it's got psychological resistance at 150, 200, 250, 300. It's got VPVR resistance at those levels. It's got yearly pivots at those levels. It's got local highs at those levels. So there's a lot of stuff it's going to need to get through. It's going to be a slog, a range fest over the next few months, I think, for ETH. Um, the 5200 is cross bearish, just like everything else. So there's not really much value there because it's not trending. It's just heavily ranging. Did find this pitchfork, which is merely a trend channel for with specific rules. So it's got three anchor points, extreme highs, extreme lows in price. And it's going to want to return to the median line, which is the middle of the range. It'll act as a magnet for price. And you can get fancy and add more values here for diagonals, whatever you want to do. I don't tend to do that early on just because you know, there's no price history here. Why would you? You're just making stuff up, right? I like to add lines. You know, we had a, we hit a local high. We hit these local highs. This lines up nicely. Is it curve fitting? Sure. But it helps project the trend going forward. So I'm looking at 235 plus over the next however many months. Um, it's probably just going to range pretty heavy. I don't expect anything crazy anytime soon. And looking at the cloud, 180 is the flat Kumo here, the Kijun. You can see it's massively up from the candle lows here. It'll be interesting to see when those ETH longs finally start unwinding. If they wait till price is a little bit above 200 or if they start unwinding between 200 and 180. I don't really see a big reason. I mean, this is, a, what is this? Two years plus almost range of 350 to 100 essentially. So it's just like, there's no trend here. There's certainly lower time frame trend, trends, but any of the bullish trends have been sort of parabolic and then quickly 
sold off. And lastly, let's just take a look at ETH, let's take a look at ETH PTC. It had this nice Adam Eve bullish Kuma breakout above the 200. Couldn't really get past this key resistance level, historic resistance support level. It didn't confirm it as support, didn't confirm the pivot as support, and it sort of melted back down to this previous accumulation range. So I like that it held to the upside of this accumulation range. I like that it's back above the 200. I like that it's inside the cloud, not below the cloud. This has a lot of time, just like the ETHUSD pair, it's going to need to range for a long time, I think. Eight weeks, maybe. Two months, six months, maybe. I don't think this is going anywhere anytime soon, just based on trend metrics and based on price history. Uh, historically, this level has been massive, this 025, probably in part because of the psychological level there.